in the last lecture, we discussed about water distribution networks. In this lecture, we will discuss about sanitary sewerage systems. First of all, what is a sewer? A sewer is a pipe or conduit that carries wastewater. Now, a sanitary sewer is the one which carries sanitary wastewater. Now, what is sanitary wastewater? This is the wastewater coming from residences, institutions, commercial establishments, and industries. That is what we call a sanitary wastewater. Now, a sanitary sewerage system, what is it? This is nothing but a network of sanitary sewers. What are the important considerations that we have to remember while designing a sanitary sewerage system? First of all, a sanitary sewerage system transports wastewater from one location to another by gravity. This is very important. That is, it is transporting wastewater from one location to another by gravity. This is because uh, we want to tra transport this water by gravity because it gives low maintenance cost. The operating cost also will be low because we will not be having much of pumping and it also requires limited skilled personnel to implement these projects or construct these projects or maintain these projects. So that is one important thing. Other one is uh, while designing, we design the system such that the sewers can resist erosion and corrosion. Where is the erosion coming from? Erosion comes because this sewage which is being carried in a sanitary sewer may have lot of suspended matter and grit and other material which can abrade against the sewer walls and then can erode. So we have to design the system such that it can erode it can, uh, it can resist this erosion. The other important point in the design of a sanitary sewer system is the corrosion. The corrosion occurs because of release of hydrogen sulfide gas. Uh, the water, that the wastewater which is being carried in a sanitary sewer system con uh, contains lot of sulfates and because of that hydrogen gas can get produced and that can lead to corrosion. So the system should be designed such that it can resist this corrosion. The other important consideration in the design of sanitary sewer system is it should withstand backfill, impact, and live loads. The sewers are laid underground. There is a lot of cover above this and that back backfill and they are also laid under the roads. So there will be traffic load that is coming from these loads which gets transferred to these sewers. So they should withstand that backfill, impact, and live loads. Other important considerations of the design are they should have adequate flow velocity. The velocity in sewers should not be below a minimum value because if their velocity is not very high, then anaerobic conditions can set in or septic conditions can set in and that can lead to more of uh, the corrosion of the pipelines. Not only that, if the velocity is not very high, then the uh, suspended matter can get settled down to the bottom of the sewers and that can lead to decrease in the capacity of the pipeline. Also, it can lead to enhanced corrosion. So the velocity in sewers should be more than a minimum value. This is very, very important in the design of sanitary sewers. Again, the important points in the design of uh, sanitary sewers are ease and economy in maintenance. That is, it requires constant maintenance, otherwise the system will not perform to what we want. So the maintenance, the design should consider at the design stage itself, the maintenance aspects should be considered while uh, designing the sanitary sewer systems. And of course, the economy is always important in the design of any system. So whatever the sanitary sewer system that we are designing, it should have a minimum capital cost plus minimum operating and maintenance cost. Safety to personnel and public is also very important while designing a sanitary sewer system because the people will be getting into the sewer system through manholes for the maintenance and they should be taught properly about the dangers of health uh, risks and things like that before they get into the sewer system and that should be considered while designing a proper sewer system. What are the decisions to be taken while designing a sewer system. First of all, 
we have to decide upon the location of the sewers. The wastewater is generated in the houses, in the commercial establishments, in the institutions and industries. From that it has to be taken to the treatment plant before it is released into the receiving water body or uh, lake or river or things like that. So, we have to see how we transport this water through the sewers and so the location of the sewers is the first decision we have to take while designing a sanitary sewerage system. The next important thing is the size of these sewer lines. What should be the diameter of each of the sewers? What should be the diameter of the lateral? What should be the diameter of a branch? What should be the diameter of the interceptor or the trunk main? And the other important thing is what at what slope the sewer should be laid because the slope affects the velocity. If the slope of the sewer is not very high, then the velocity will be very low and that can lead to deposition of the solids and consequent corrosion problems and uh, etc. So, the slope should be, uh, should be high. At the same time, if the slope is very high, then the sewer will be buried very deep into the ground and that can lead to extra cost in trenching etc. So, the slope and depth of burial are interrelated factors in the decisions to be taken while designing the sewer system. The other important point in the design of sewer systems is what material we should use for the sewers. The materials could be brick, concrete or plastic or steel and things. So, which sewer, uh, which material we should use for this sewer system. The other important points in the the design for sewer systems are appurtenances, where we should locate manholes, where we should locate junctions, the flow measuring devices, etc. That also we have to take the decision. Before we go to the design of a sewer system, we will discuss the main difference between sewerage system and water distribution system. In a water distribution system, water can flow either by gravity or by pressure. In fact, in a water distribution system, even if pumps are not there, the pipes will be flowing full under pressure. Whereas, in a sewerage system, the water can be carried through the sewer lines, whether they are covered or uncovered, the flow conditions we have are free surface flow conditions. That means, a sewer system, even if it is covered, it should not be operated such that there is surcharge. That is, the wastewater is being carried under pressurized conditions. So, flow is by gravity in a sewerage system as opposed to the flow in a water distribution network. Then, that is why they are designed as open channels, but with covers. There is more suspended matter in a sewerage uh, pipeline as compared to a water distribution pipeline. And that also should be taken into consideration while designing. In a water distribution network or water distribution pipeline, there is little scope for the release of gases like hydrogen sulfide which lead to corrosion. Whereas, in a sewer line, there is this corrosion is a very, very important factor. What are the design criteria that we have to worry about while designing a sewerage system? The design period is the first thing because we will not design a sewerage system for the present conditions or for the present needs. Because once we put in the system, we expect it to operate in a proper manner for the next 20 years or 30 years or 10 years. So, the design period is an important consideration. Typically, laterals are designed for ultimate population density in a particular area. Whereas, a large sewer is designed for 25 to 50 years in future. The minimum size is another important criteria we should not use any sewer line which has a diameter less than 150 mm because this may lead to the problems in the maintenance. So, the minimum diameter size, minimum size for a sewer line is 150 mm. The minimum velocity, I have already talked about why we should maintain a minimum velocity in a sewer line. The minimum velocity should be more than the 0.7 meters per second under extraordinary circumstances, we may allow 0.6 meters per second in a sewer line. Maximum velocity, this consideration comes from the, uh, from the requirement that there should not be any erosion 
So, the maximum velocity cannot exceed more than 2 meters per second at any point in the system. The minimum depth, a sewer line should be buried in the ground. So, it should be buried in such a way that it can receive waste water from the basements of the buildings. If the basements of the buildings are below the elevation of the sewer line, then the waste water from the buildings cannot enter into the system by gravity. So, there should be sufficient depth such that the waste water from the basements can enter into the sewer system. It again, it should be more than 1 meters below ground. It should all it should be more than 0.9 meters below the basement floor. It should not be above the water line. The sewer line should not be above the water line. This is another important consideration because the if the sewer line is above the water line and the joints in the sewer system and the water distribution network are not watertight, then waste water from the sewer line can enter into the water distribution network and can cause I mean can uh, spread diseases. So, the sewer line should always be above the water line. If we are permitting high velocities in a sewer line, then we should make provision for thrust, abrasion and turbulence. The high velocities can cause turbulence. As you know, the Reynolds number of the flow, if it is more than 2000, turbulence sets in. If there is turbulence, then the will be easier for gases to escape from the solution. So, the turbulence should be avoided as much as possible. The manholes are very important part of the sewerage system. The spacing for the manholes depends upon what kind of methodology we are using for maintenance. In India, the spacing is 30 meters in urban areas. If we are following mechanized method of cleaning these sewerage systems or sewers, then we can go for longer lengths or longer spacing between the manholes. Again, manholes are necessary wherever there is a change of alignment. The change of alignment is the change of direction in the horizontal plane or the change in the slope. So, the manholes should be provided wherever there is a change of alignment. Manholes are also provided at all the junctions, wherever the laterals are meeting the mains or where the branches are meeting the mains. At a manhole, the crowns of pipes, they would be more than two or more than or equal to two or three pipes will be meeting at a manhole. So, the crowns of all these pipes should be at the same elevation at a manhole. At a manhole, flow is to be streamlined. The streamlining is necessary to reduce the head loss at a manhole and also to reduce the turbulence level. If as I mentioned earlier, if there is too much of turbulence, then the release of gases is facilitated and that can lead to corrosion. Before we go to the design of a sewer, we will discuss how we can analyze the flow in a sewer. Here you can see the picture of a sewer and as I mentioned earlier, the sewer should be designed such that the water is carried under free surface conditions. That means, sewer will not be operating under full conditions or pressurized conditions. In such a situation, we can use open channel flow equations for describing the flow in a sewer. The open channel flow equation that we use for designing the sewer is the classical Manning's equation. This Manning's equation is valid for uniform and steady flow conditions. So, our design of a sewer system is always based on steady, uniform, free surface flow conditions such that the D actual flow depth divided by the diameter of the sewer should always be less than 0.8. Here, the Manning's equation is velocity is equal to 1 over n multiplied by r h to the power 2 thirds under root s 0. If I put it in terms of the flow rate, it will be q which is equal to discharge is equal to 1 over n a, a is the area of the cross section, the flow area multiplied by r h to the power 2 thirds under root s 0, r h is the 
hydraulic radius and S0 is the slope of the sewer. RH hydraulic radius is given as A that is flow area divided by P. P is the wetted perimeter. This is the equation we use for analyzing the flow in a sewer. While designing the sewers, we can see that if I have less slope that is S0 is very less, then the velocity will also be less and that can lead to deposition of the solids. If I have S0 a very high value, then velocity will be very high. If the velocity is very high, then abrasion can take place. Not only that, if S0 is very high, then the depth of sewer will be increasing in the downstream direction. That is why we have to choose this slope of the sewer in a proper manner. Now, interaction between slopes and depths. Imagine there is a situation where your sewer line is buried underground. That is the most common situation. The ground slope in this particular case is 0 0.033 percent, whereas the minimum slope required for the sewer to have a minimum velocity of either 0.6 meters per second or let us say 0.7 meters per second is equal to 0.33 percent. The sewer grade is greater than the ground slope. If I have to maintain a minimum depth of 1 meter at the entrance to, to the sewer, that is the entrance depth, let us say if I have to maintain 1 meter there and if the sewer grade is greater than the ground slope in the downstream direction, the sewer will be buried very deeper into the ground. That can increase your the trenching cost and the construction cost for the manholes and the capital cost for the manholes and even the maintenance cost can be in, will be increased. Therefore, to economize on that side, we need to pull up the sewer closer to the ground after some time. This can be done by having a pumping. So, a small pumping station may be required or a small pump can be put in the manhole and can lift this wastewater to another sewer which is not buried so deep. Consider another situation where your ground is very steeply sloping. Let us say ground slope is 1 percent, whereas the minimum slope required for the sewer to carry the water at minimum velocity is 0.7 percent. Even if I want to carry water at a higher slope, let us say if I, if I take the slope of the sewer greater than this 0.7 percent, but it is less than the ground slope, what happens? In the downstream direction, the sewer will be coming closer and closer to the ground surface. That is not allowed. We need to maintain a minimum slope, minimum depth of burial of let us say 1 meter. In such a situation, what can we do? We have to have a fall or a drop in the sewer and then the at the manhole, the outgoing sewer can be put at a lower elevation than the incoming sewer. So, that interaction between slopes and depths is very important to maintain the required velocity within the limits, that is between the minimum velocity requirement and the maximum velocity requirement and the necessary for pumping or the necessary for providing drops and the overall economy and ease of maintenance. Sometimes we may have to forego the self-cleansing velocities in the uh, lateral sewers. That is because if the lateral sewer is laid at a steeper slope, it may reach the main sewer at a lower elevation. So, to lift the water from the lateral sewer to the main sewer, we may require some pumping. We may not be wanting that due to maintenance problems. So, in such a case, what we do is we put a lateral sewer at a flatter slope such that it meets the main sewer at, at the right elevation. If that slope is less than the slope that is required for maintaining minimum velocities, then lateral sewers can get clogged more frequently. So, we can, we should go for more frequent maintenance cleaning of this lateral sewers in such a case. Because if we go for a lateral sewer, which is if we do not want to lower the lateral sewer, but we want to lower the main sewer, then that may also lead to more uneconomical situation. Before we go to the design, 
what is the information that is required to start the design. First of all, we need to have detailed plan and profile of the streets. This will tell us how to locate our sanitary sewers. Cellar level elevations of buildings is also an important information. This will tell us at what depth we should lay our sewer lines. The locations and elevations of existing drains, that is very important because if you are going for capacity enhancement, then we should know how to lay the newer pipes in relation to the ones which are already existent. The locations and elevations of existing projected, existing or projected surface and subsurface utilities. As I have already mentioned, the sewer lines should always be below water distribution lines. So, we should know the locations of water distribution lines before we lay the sewer lines. That information is very important. Now, information required for design. What else information is required? The characteristics of soil is a very important information because the sewers are lay buried under the ground. They should be designed to take the load, the overburden load and the traffic load. So, in that sense, the characteristics of the soil is very, very important. How the loads are trans transmitted from the road surface to the sewer line depends upon the characteristics of the soil. Then depth of groundwater table is also very important. If the sewer is laid deep into the groundwater, then some amount of groundwater can always leak into the sewer line. So, the capacity of the sewer line should be such that it is not only carrying the waste water from the buildings, but it is also carrying the infiltrated water from the groundwater. So, that is an important information. Nature of street paving is also an important information because that tells us how the load transfer is taking place. Then the location and availability of sites for pumping stations and treatment plants. This is another important information because the layout of the sewer line depends upon where we are locating the treatment plant, where the place is available to locate the treatment plant and where the pumping has to be carried out. That will decide on how we are, the, how we are configuring our network. The nature of receiving body is also an important consideration or the information that is required for the design of sewer systems. Because if it is a lake or if it is a river or if it is a pond or what we are doing with this treated wastewater is an important, has an important bearing on the design of sewer systems. This we can see in little bit more detail later on. What is the design procedure? First of all, make a preliminary layout of system. The place sewers in streets in proper reference to building sewers, manholes and laterals. For this, we have the maps. We can also use geographic information systems for this particular step in the design. One important point to remember while doing this exercise is sewers should slope with ground as far as possible. If it is more than the ground slope, then the depth of burial will be higher. If it is less than the ground slope, then sewer may come very close to the ground. This we have seen already. Another important point is follow a direct route. We should not lay sewers on a curved path. The sewers should be straight from one point to another point. That will facilitate easy maintenance. Show all the sewers as a single line. Look at the figure. You have this is one sewer, this is another sewer, this is another sewer. So, show all the sewers as single lines. You, we place the arrows to show the flow direction. So, this is a lateral which is carrying water from this manhole to this manhole. This is another lateral which is carrying water to this manhole. The water is being carried from here to here. So, we place arrows to show flow direction. We show manholes as circles on this figure. This will facilitate the, the computations in a step by step manner. 
the next step is preparation of alternate layouts. There could be several ways of carrying the waste water from its place of origin to the treatment plant. We should prepare alternate layouts and see which one gives us the overall economy and which meets us all which meets all the constraints. Then sketch the limits of service area for each lateral. For example, if we have this lateral here, the service area for this lateral could be in this service area could be this one. For this lateral, the service area could be like this. The service area for this lateral is like this. So, we have to prepare the, we have to sketch the limits of service area for each lateral. This gives us what should be the size of that sewer because we can find out what is the, the amount of waste water generated in that locality and this particular lateral should carry. The next step is measure the service area for each lateral. Estimate the required carrying capacity for each lateral based on population density and service area. If we know the population density and if we know the service area, then we know what is the population. We also know how much of drinking water we are supplying to this population. Per capita consumption of drinking water is known. We assume that about 80 percent of this per capita consumption of drinking water appears as a sewage. That way we can estimate what is the amount of waste water that this particular lateral has to carry. Next, estimate the required carrying capacity for each branch and main, main line based on proposed layout. For example, if we consider this particular sewer line, this particular sewer line should carry all the waste water that is coming from here, that is coming from this lateral, that is coming from this lateral and that is coming from this lateral for the combined the discharge from 1, 2, 3, 4. These four laterals is appearing in this particular line. So, it should be designed for that. Whereas, this particular line is designed only for the waste water coming from this lateral and this lateral. So, depending upon the configuration and how the connectivities are occurring in the network, we can find out what should be the carrying capacity of each line in the system. Next important step is we have to make hydraulic calculations based on Manning's equation. Look at this equation Q is equal to 1 over n A R H to the power of 2 thirds under root S 0. In this the decision variables are the slope of the sewer line and the depth of flow are based on the depth of flow what should be the diameter of the sewer line. What we know in this equation is Q that is the flow rate or design carrying capacity for the sewer line. There is only one equation here, but we need to find out two parameters the slope of the sewer and the depth of the flow or the diameter of the sewer line. So, we have to choose one to start with. We choose the slope of the sewer line S0 based on minimum velocity required for present scenario. Why are we considering the present scenario? Because if we consider the future scenario, but we are operating now, the actual amount of waste water that is flowing through the system is less than the design, less than what the sewer system is designed for. So, definitely the velocity will be low for the present operating conditions or the immediate operating conditions. So, that velocity should be more than the minimum value. That is the reason why we choose S0 based on minimum velocity required for present scenario. There are certain guidelines available for choosing this S0 value depending upon what is the flow rate in the sewer line. For example, if the flow rate is 2 liters per second, then S0 divided by 1000 should be 6. If it is 3 liters per second, it should be 4. 
and if it is 5, it should be 3.1. But please remember this is only a guideline. We should choose the slope based on this guideline, based on what would be the actual velocity for the present the flow rate that may come immediately after the installation of the system and the ground slope. After determining S0 or after choosing the S0 value, we have to choose the diameter for the sewer line. We choose a diameter D. As I mentioned, while choosing this diameter, we also should remember that a minimum diameter value of 150 mm has to be ensured. After choosing the diameter D, the actual flow depth may not be equal to D. In fact, it should not be equal to the diameter of the sewer line. So, in this equation, we know the value of the flow rate Q, we know the value of S0, we have chosen a particular diameter for the sewer line D. Area, area of the flow will be a function of the actual flow depth divided by the diameter of the sewer line. Similarly, the wetted perimeter will also be a function of the actual flow depth D and the diameter D of the sewer. And N, the Manning's roughness coefficient for a sewer line is a function of depth of the flow. It is not a constant. So, depending upon D by D, we have to choose the N value. If we put these functional relationships in this equation, then we have one equation in one unknown. That is, the unknown is the lower case d value or the depth of the flow. So, we can solve for this depth of the flow. As you can see here, this equation is a nonlinear equation in one unknown d. And that we can solve for using any numerical method like Newton Raphson method or Picard iteration method. There are also design aids available in standard textbooks and standard manuals. So, we can use those design aids to solve for this equation and obtain the value of D, which is the flow depth. After determining the flow depth in each of the sewer lines, we have to check if the design satisfies all the constraints. What are the constraints? Actual flow depth divided by the chosen diameter should be less than 0.8. We always need to have a clear space between the water surface and the crown of the sewer line. That is the only way we can ensure free surface flow conditions. Then we check for the actual velocity. Once we determine the flow depth, if we know what is the act flow, uh, what is the Q value, then Q divided by the flow area will give you the velocity. Now, that V actual should be greater than a minimum value. That V actual should be less than a maximum value. Then for the chosen slope and the known ground slope, we draw the profile of the sewer line between the two manholes and see what is the depth of burial for this sewer line at any point. This depth of burial should be greater than a minimum value. Next, for a given layout, as I have mentioned earlier, several alternative designs are possible depending upon what value of S0 we have chosen. And for each of these layouts, we work out the hydraulics of the flow, we check for the constraints and if the constraints are satisfied, then we work out the cost. The cost based on the diameter of the sewer line, the depth of the trenching and what could be the operating cost if some pumps are provided and what could be the uh, maintenance cost depending on the depth of burial and so on. We work out the total cost, the capital cost plus operating cost plus the maintenance cost. We choose that alternative which gives the most 
the least cost or the most economical one. As mentioned earlier, several alternative layouts are possible. For each of these layouts, we come up with what is the most economical diameters and what is the most economical slopes. So, for each layout, we have the most economical solution. Then, we scan through this most economical solutions for each layout and come up with what is the layout that we want to adopt finally. That would give you a global minimal cost in terms of the laying off of the system. This is the in the nutshell the complete design procedure for a sewerage system. The sewerage systems are different from water distribution system in one aspect the corrosion. Corrosion is an important factor in the design of a sewerage system. We should understand what is causing this corrosion and what affects this corrosion and how we prevent this corrosion. As you know, wastewater contains sulphates. These sulphates are usually reduced by sulphate reducing bacteria under anaerobic conditions to sulphides. Sulphate reducing bacteria are found in all the waste waters and sulphides can get produced because of this sulphate reducing bacteria. The sulphide combines with hydrogen or H2 to give hydrogen sulphide or H2S. The H2S gas can get released to air space above and once it gets released to the air space above, it can get oxidized biologically to sulfuric acid and this sulfuric acid is the one which is primarily responsible for the corrosion of the sewer lines. What are the factors which affect this corrosion? Dissolved oxygen is an important parameter. If dissolved oxygen is very high, then the anaerobic conditions are not predominant or aerobic conditions will be predominant. And the sulphate reducing bacteria will not be very active. The temperature, if the temperature is high, you know the chemical reactions can go in more easier manner. So, the temperature is an important factor which affects this corrosion. The concentration of organic matter, if organic matter is not present, then the sulphate reducing bacteria will not be active and there is no biodegradation that is taking place. So, the concentration of organic matter, if it is very high, then the corrosion is more likely. The concentration of metals is another important factor. Any metal can combine with hydrogen sulphide and can precipitate. So, if metals are present, then the corrosion activity will be less. As you know, pH is always an important factor in any chemical reaction. So, the sulphate reducing bacteria survive within a particular range of pH. If the pH is above that or below that particular range, then they will not be active. And of course, sulphate concentration itself is an important parameter. If sulphates are not present, then corrosion will be very less. How do we control this corrosion? We can control corrosion by creating aerobic conditions or going away from anaerobic conditions that we can do by adding oxygen or air or hydrogen peroxide. We can reduce anaerobic growth of microbes using chlorine. If we add chlorine to the wastewater, that will kill the anaerobic bacteria or we can change the pH by adding sodium hydroxide NaOH. If we add NaOH, it increases the pH to a very high value under which conditions this SRB cannot survive. Again, we can also oxidize this H2S instead of forming hydro, uh, instead of forming sulfuric acid, I can oxidize this H2S by chemical addition. Next important thing in the design of sewer, sewerage systems is the layout. There are different layouts which are possible. For example, we are showing a perpendicular pattern here. In this perpendicular pattern, the storm water is combined with 
the sanitary sewerage sewage and it is disposed of into a river at the closest point. So, this gives a perpendicular pattern. For example, here this is the lateral, this lateral is carrying the waste water as well as the storm water into this sub main sewer. The sub main sewer will carry this combined waste water and storm water to a main or trunk sewer and this main or trunk sewer will dispose of the waste water into the river at this location. From this area, this is the lateral and this is another lateral, this is another lateral and this is a sub main and this also discharges this waste water at this location. This is what we call a perpendicular pattern. The problem with the perpendicular pattern is the waste water is discharged at several locations in the river and we should see what is the effect of the disposal of this waste water in this river because we are not treating this waste water before releasing it to the river here in this particular uh, in this particular pattern. Therefore, we go for another system where we intercept the waste water before it is discharged into the, the river. Here in the interceptor design, the waste water from several locations and sub mains is collected in a main pipeline called an interceptor and this interceptor carries the waste water to one single pumping station and treatment station. After it gets treated, it gets discharged into the river or lake. Before it goes to the pumping station or the treatment station, some amount of waste water can also get released into the river or the lake. That is what we call the overflow. Why do we need this overflow? This is a combined system which carries water during the rainy season, the storm water during the rainy season as well as the waste water from the domestic areas. During non-rainy season, the, the carrying capacity required for this interceptor is very small, whereas during the rainy season, the carrying capacity for this interceptor should be very high. If we are going to design this interceptor for the maximum possible rain in that area, then the size of this interceptor will be very, very high as well as the size of the pumping station as well as the size of treatment plant will be very high. So, we do not design this treatment plant, pumping station and this, this part of the interceptor for the maximum possible rain or maximum possible the storm discharge. We design for some averaging conditions, but during a heavy rainfall, we need to divert the water without the treatment into the estuary or the river and that is why we have this overflow paths in this interceptor pattern. The problem with the interceptor pattern is the main interceptor line is near the water front. The soil conditions generally there are not very conducive to the structural strength of this interceptor. So, what we do is again if we have only one interceptor like this, the size of the interceptor will be very high, the maintenance will not be very easy. So, in the next pattern which is called the zone pattern, we intercept at several levels. We have a high level interceptor here, we have an intermediate level interceptor here and we have a low level interceptor here. So, this low level interceptor, this is the contour line, these are the contour lines, this is the high ground, this is the intermediate ground and this is the low level ground. So, from the low level areas, the water is collected in the low level interceptor and from high grounds, the water is con uh, collected in the high level interceptor. Now, all these interceptors, this interceptor has an overflow provision at this location. This intermediate level interceptor has an overflow provision at this location and the low level interceptor has an overflow at, uh, at this location and from all these interceptors, water is taken to the treatment works and after it is treated, it is dumped into the river. 
the low level interceptor will need to have a pumping station because it is at a low level and the treatment plant could be at a higher ground. So, there may be a requirement of a pumping station here. This is what we call the zone pattern which we adopt for a combined sewerage system. A combined sewerage system is the one which carries both the sanitary sewage as well as the storm water. Another pattern is what is known as fan pattern. In the fan pattern, we collect the sanitary sewage. The fan pattern is typically adopted for sanitary sewerage systems. In this fan pattern, sewage from all the outskirts of the city are collected and taken towards the water front. For example, the sewage from here, this is a lateral, it is coming and then joining in a, a sub main and from the sub main it is going to the trunk sewer. So, from all the outskirts of the city or from all the locations of the city, the sewage is carried to one single treatment works here like a fan and the, it is treated and through the outfall it is discharged into the lake. This is called the outfall sewer because it is carrying the water from the trunk sewer to the outfall. The problem with this fan pattern is typically if we have a water front, they are also developed much more than the other parts of the city. So, this is already crowded, this is already developed and as the city is expanding outwards, we may lay more and more lateral sewers. So, this lateral sewers design is not a problem, but all these lateral sewers now they will be contributing to the, the outfall sewer. The outfall sewer should be able to take this extra amount of wastewater that is coming in, but this area is already developed. So, removing this outfall sewer or changing it to a larger size or laying a parallel outfall sewer is going to be a problem in this fan pattern. So, we go in for another pattern in such situations. This is called the radial pattern. In the radial pattern, the wastewater from the middle of the town is carried towards the outskirts. For example, this is the one main and this is carrying water from this area, this whole area into this particular discharge point. Whereas, the sanitary sewage from this area is being carried to this main line and to this treatment works here and from this area it is carried outwards to this discharge point. The problem with this radial pattern is we need to have several treatment facilities. We need to have a treatment facility here, we also need to have a treatment facility here, we need to have a treatment facility here as well as we need to have a proper discharging situation. I mean where are we going to discharge this? Here I have a river, I can discharge the treated water. Here I do not have a water body. So, I have, I can take this treated water and apply to the irrigation fields. But then I have to see to what level I should treat this water. So, that may create some problems or it may increase the cost of the system. The last thing I would like to discuss in this lecture is the sewer materials. The factors which affect the selection of the materials are the material should be resistance to acids, gases and solvents. It should resist erosion and scour. We have already seen where this erosion is coming from because of the grit. It should have enough strength because sewers are buried underground. They have to take the load of the overfill or backfill and the traffic load. They should have enough strength. The cost of the sewer line should be a minimal. We should have ease in the assembly of several sewer lines and appurtenances etcetera and the handling, we should have ease in handling. Availability of appurtenance and fittings is another important factor. Whatever is the material of the sewer line, the appurtenance and fittings should also be made of similar material or the same material. So, they should be available. The flow characteristics also affect the selection of the material. If the material is very rough, then 
the carrying capacity will be low for that kind of a sewer made of that material. So, it should be smooth enough to carry the flow very easily. What are the different materials we have? For example, brick is a very common material for the sewer lines. The problems with the brick sewer lines are high cost. Also, it requires large space for construction and the progress of work if we are using brick as a sewer material is generally slow. One important consideration is we should have a minimum of 12.5 mm thick cement plaster cover when we are going for brick as a sewer material. Because if we do not have this cement plaster cover, then the sewer line could be leaking profusely. Concrete is another common material for sewer lines, because we can get a reasonable strength with concrete by properly having a mix and reinforcement. It, it facilitates the sewer line, the construction of sewer lines of a wide range of sewer lines. The construction can be very rapid. However, the concrete lines are very are susceptible to corrosion if the sewage contains acid material. The septic conditions if are present at low flow velocities that can corrode the concrete. To have to get over this problem, we can use a high alumina cement. Vitrified clay or stoneware is another material which is normally used for construction of sewers. They are typically available from 80 to 1000 mm sizes. Standard fittings are available. They can resist corrosion from most assets. They can resist erosion due to grit. However, the vitrified clay or stoneware sewers require special bedding or concrete cradling to increase their strength. And other problem we have with this kind of material is they are difficult to handle while constructing many of these sewers can break very easily because they are brittle material. Asbestos cement is another material which we can, can use for sewers. They are non-corrosive, they are very smooth and give good flow characteristics. They are lightweight, we can easily machine and we can easily handle this. However, the problems with asbestos cement are it is highly carcinogenic. As you already know, in most of the, most of the developed world, this asbestos cement, asbestos is banned. Another problem with this asbestos cement pipes is its low strength. Just like the vitrified clay and stone wares, this asbestos cement sewer lines also require the special bedding to increase the strength. We can also use iron and steel as sewer material. In fact, iron and steel is the most common material for sewer lines when they are designed as pressure sewers. For sewers above ground, within seaways treatment plants and where absolute water tight joints are required are where long laying lengths are required, but they are susceptible to corrosion. We can also use plastic pipes, glass fiber reinforced plastic pipes and fiberglass reinforced pipes for sewers. To summarize, in this lecture we have seen what are the main considerations in the design of sanitary sewerage system. We looked at how the design is carried out. What are the design steps? What is the equation used for determining the flow characteristics? We also looked at what are the different patterns we can adopt for laying the sewer lines. How it is important to prevent or control the corrosion and what are the materials that can be used for sewer lines.
Thank you.